Hi everyone and welcome to my channel called Zuzana React where I learn all about India with your help and I share my European Slovak uh, perspective and in today's video I will share a video of Mr. Jay Shankar on the Ranveer show if that's how you pronounce that and I haven't seen this video and I invite you to watch it with me so with further ado let's dive right into that video uh, the most requested podcast possibly that we ever had. How how are you, and why do you think that is? <laughs> oh, I'm good. Uh, been a busy few weeks, uh, okay. but uh, I would say probably people are more interested in foreign policy uh, nowadays. Nowadays, uh, uh, and maybe they're going to watch you. <laughs> uh, you know. So uh. okay. So quick question here: Are you guys now more interested in foreign policy, or is it just simply because Jay Shankar, in my personal opinion, is so good? I mean, geopolitics is one of those subjects that people have been lapping up only recently, but lapping it up heavily. And you're the poster boy for everything that's happening, correct, geopolitically for India. Uh, okay, that's good to know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, in a way, it's, it's natural. Look, what do we do most of the time? Uh, you get up in the morning, first thing you do is reach out for your phone, right? Mm. So I just wanted to say that I said this video on 1.5 speed, uh, so uh, you don't have to spend so much time with me on the other hand uh, because it's quite a long video so let's just continue uh, and see what is it you missed when you're sleeping mm. what it's done is it has connected us completely to the world yep and because of the phone and then you build everything around it uh, once you start getting used to global content and global comparisons then you know what you eat what you read what you think everything becomes global yeah so a quick question for you uh do you guys um compare yourself uh, with the other nations at all? We are. I mean, that's why they call it globalization. Mm, okay. Uh, simple question for you. Who is Dr. S. Jayashankar, the man like that people don't know? I'll tell you why. Right now, you're very popular on shorts and reels mm -hmm. for your very aggressive uh, comebacks and your very aggressive responses. And in many ways, I feel like Virat Kohli and yourself are the faces of young India in some ways. This no, is there's there's a slight age difference between us. <laughs> no, but you're still, you're still the guy young India is like cheering for. When we see you up there talking to all these people from other countries, we're like, yeah, that's, that's the response that they should get. Look, uh, you know, I'm... So uh, maybe a quick question here. Do you find, in your own opinion, um, Jay Shankar inspirational for you personally? And if so, why? Let me know in the comments below. I'm a trained diplomat whose general SOP is, you know, keep it, play it cool, uh, uh, sort of don't make too many waves, etc. Uh, now, partly I've transitioned into being uh, a political face. Okay, but oh. even I would say the diplomatic side of me, which is still very deep. Uh, uh, after all, I've done it for forty-five years, maybe more now. Uh, it's like this, you know. I'm very uh, nice to people who are nice to me. When I get pushed, I think it's natural to push back. And one of the things that has I love that. Uh, if people are nice to me, I'm nice. If if people are pushing me, I give it back. So it's an equal give and take, I guess, from him. It's been happening to a bit. Is in the last year, year and a half, people have been pushing us a bit. Yeah. So so I feel. I mean, it's it's you you raised you brought up Virat Kohli and cricket analogy. You know, if uh, you get a few bounces, you 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 want to, <laughs> you want to do something with it. No? Hit that push yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I love this guy. He is so. You know what I like about him. I feel like he is a genuine person. I don't know what you guys feel about him. Like, obviously, I just see very short shorts of him and I don't really know the political situation in India, etc. But he just does come across like a very genuine person. Like, it's genuinely good, I would say. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Um, you know, when you say the sentence, when I get pushed, in many ways, your I get pushed is actually when India gets pushed. Absolutely. And you are the personification of India on a global scale. Keeping that in mind, I want to ask you why PM Modi said that you have adbud thoughts. Uh, no, I, I not, he didn't exactly say adbud. I think he said, Andaruni, Andaruni. Uh, ha, unko bahut hai. Look, to be very frank, we got off a plane. I was myself a little bit zonked uh, getting off the plane. <laughs> uh, and he was talking about uh, uh, just outside to a group of supporters. And uh, I guess, I, I didn't ask him after that, okay? I guess what he was really saying is, look, this guy has watched a lot of people come and go. Uh, so he's seen a lot. So maybe you should talk to him and ask him what, you know, what's different. What's your gauge? Uh, what's different? Yeah, about you. No, I don't think it was so much what he was talking about me. He was actually saying that, look, guys, talk to him because he will tell you how much, you know, uh, the prime minister's visits have changed, how much foreign policy has changed, how much the country has changed. So it was more his, uh, it was my thoughts rather than me as a subject that he was talking about. <laughs> uh, that's my, my take off. I think it's one and the same thing. Uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> okay. I had Ishant Sharma on the show yesterday. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, he spoke. 
who is Ishan Sharma? Let me know. But how after a certain point, because you've played so much cricket and you have so many experiences that you've had, your pattern recognition improves. Some people would call pattern recognition intuition or the sixth sense. I am a hundred percent sure that even on a geopolitical scale, there is a role of your sixth sense. Absolutely, I agree. Can you talk a little bit about this, like a slightly higher level of pattern recognition, or even go one level higher than that? Is there like a spiritual aspect? I mean, I use that word cautiously. Ah, Look, I love the fact that he's a calling out like the sixth sense, spirituality, and politics. That's a very interesting angle. What happens is uh, there is this is partly experience, but it's partly also hard work. Hmm? Any business, you again, we are using a sports, but I would use it in my own yeah. own line of work. Uh, you you spend a lot of time reading other players, understanding their game. You know their their play. How 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 does it work? Their mind games which they try on you. So you try to see patterns in other people, in other countries, in other uh, you know other foreign ministries, etc. Just like you do in sports. So in that sense, there's something. I love the analogy. I think that what he's his comeback to that is like well, perhaps not really spiritual. It's just an experience and the years of hard work where you, you know, get to learn people. So that's an interesting comeback. Very, it's, it's a competitive activity. So if you're going up against a competitor, and I am a very competitive person, okay. I mean, when you ask me that bit, I, I absolutely <laughs> let you know. I mean, I try to work out as much of it in sports, but I still have a lot left over uh, for my real business. So when you, when you, if you are a competitive person, the, all the time your sixth sense, as you call it, is working on you are, you know, one part I'm listening to you, but if, you know, I've seen you do this before, we've talked before, I've seen, I'm prepared by uh, watching you or studying you before. The sixth sense takes over. So sometimes, you know, when you are in a situation, okay. or people sometimes ask you saying, oh, did you think about that line before? I didn't. I mean, that sixth sense takes over at that time because you already. And it's interesting that he's like referring to it as a sixth sense. I think what he's just saying that he is trained so well and he has vast experience where it does take over for him. And it's just something that perhaps it grown into being. That's, that's what I think, I guess. Kind of, you know, it's moving faster than your mind. Mm. And it's actually telling you, okay, this, they're going to hit you with this. So you're already processing it. So you, you, you see that coming at you before it actually uh, comes at you. So uh, that's, that I would say it's more like an instinct, right? You call it spirituality. I wouldn't go that far. But, you know, yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, this is exactly what I was saying. And he says, he's trying to maybe play into the spirituality part, but what he's really saying, I, I learned this. And it's been years and years of practice for me to to be able to pick up on slight cues and be able to see where perhaps things are going. And this is why I'm quick witted to respond. Interesting. Uh, there you have. But you know, I I just want to round off the earlier point. You asked me what you know what did PM mean by that? What has changed? I think one part is we are really living uh, under uh, Prime Minister Modi in a different era. I mean, he has been in many ways personally transformational. He's he's turned the system in, in a very very radical way. I mean, I, you know, I joined the government when another Gujarati was a prime minister, Moraji Desai. Okay, so that's how far back I go. Huh? A lot of people, you know, your listeners will be wondering, okay, what the hell is he even talking about? <laughs> no, no. Huh? You're still the poster boy of young India. But, but look, uh, it's not often you get people in any line of business, leave alone in something like running a nation. You can have the big thoughts, you know, the, the strategic ideas, the grand vision. Huh? Very seriously, you have the, the revolutionary concepts that you chart out, okay, there's a different way of looking at a problem. That's one skill. And then you have going down to the details saying, okay, this does, you know, this needs to be tweaked. That detail needs to be looked at. This problem needs to be fixed. Guys, you haven't done uh, the backup on this. Usually, there are talented people, inspired people who get the big picture. There are people who are very grounded, who, who kind of uh, go down, drill down. It's very rare to find it in one person. Mm -hmm. And that I would... Oh, and I would agree with that. I think it is very rare. And it's just, I'm, I'm talking about it just from my personal work experience. It's, it's you have... Uh, exactly what he says, the, the the big vision thinkers, and then you have a like the, the people that are definitely, I would agree with him, grounded. And uh, it's it's there are people that can connect, but it takes a lot of, I guess, experience to see the big picture, but also to understand because it's almost like details inform almost the big picture. Like you can have the biggest ideas, but if you don't understand how to get there, they almost will have a hard time materializing, right? So um, balance, it's it, it's it's not found in that many people would agree with him on that. I would say to me, is a very singular quality uh, of Prime Minister Modi. And that makes it very, in a way, very interesting to work with him, but it makes it very challenging because he can challenge you right up there. He can challenge you right down there, you know. In, and that's what's your current challenge. Look, it's the world's a tough place right now. Uh, you we barely come out of this COVID thing. Um, you had this Ukraine conflict uh, and all the 
the consequences which came out of it, you know, uh, energy, food, inflation, fertilizer. Uh, if we had not handled it well, uh, we actually, you know, the Indian consumer today, the average person, you and me, it would have actually hit us in our pockets. So maybe a quick question for you. So how do you feel like the COVID and, and the Ukrainian conflict has impacted India from your personal experience? I was just be curious to see like how on your day-to-day -day life it has translated and what the impact was. If you could let me in the comments below, that would be super great. Yeah, we would have, we would have seen much higher inflation. We'd be paying much more for our oil than uh, we are. So uh, I'm actually looking at the world when at a world where everything is coming at me at the same time. You know, there's a health issue coming at me. There's an energy issue coming at me. Uh, I have a set of border problems on the boundary border areas with the Chinese. Uh, I have the pending, or you know, the old problem uh, with the Pakistanis who, you know, uh, have have uh, uh, been doing terrorism for so long. Uh Interesting. What is your challenges with China and Pakistan? Let me know in the comments below. And at the same time, I'm growing. You know, my people are traveling abroad. And for me, one big part is how, you know, foreign policy is not a kind of a board game or an academic exercise. It actually affects every person. So in my own mind, it's, it's like, how do I get this foreign policy for you, you personally, right? You know, how do I secure you when you travel? How do I look after you when you get into problems? How do I make sure if you're a student uh, that you can work on the side and support yourself? Or that, you know, you don't have to wait for two and a half years for a visa by a foreign embassy. So it's, as I said, I've also learned. These are small things, it's the big things. You gotta get them both right. Uh, the one truth I've learned about geopolitics is that it's money oriented. If you have the money, it helps you geopolitically. Second truth I've learned is that, and this I've learned in the last three days speaking to the cabinet ministers, All right. is that the role of entrepreneurs is just do your own thing, create employment, increase the exports of the country, help the country become richer. Um, would you like to give the youth and especially entrepreneurs any other geopolitical advice when it comes to this, I don't want to use the phrase India versus China, but this whole scenario, how can we help? No, I look, I think you're smart not using that phrase India versus, <laughs> India versus China for this reason. Uh, yes, we have issues with China. But that's not the only issue. I mean, we have to be fundamentally competitive. Mm. You know, uh, if I... I love that actually about him. Like he goes like, <clears throat> because I see how obviously India, and I do believe that, and you let me know what you think. But I do believe that India is going to overtake China and maybe that's what they're actually discussing here. But uh, I like that he's uh, not focusing on who he is in competition with, but how to make his country the best competitive country out there on the market. I think it's a very smart decision. If I do not have the factories, if I do not have the, uh, the as you say, the entrepreneurship, the businesses, the startup, the agriculture, huh? uh, the infrastructure, it's not just the, the Chinese. The rest of the world will also run over me. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is at the end of the day, there are roughly 200 nations in the world, okay? Okay, maybe about 125, maybe much smaller. Okay. After that, once you start grading them, there will be a zone. Okay. There'll be a zone of countries who constantly compete with each other. They could even be French. You know, the US and Europe are French. They compete like hell. Okay. So you'd have a Europe, you'd have an America, Russia, China. Then you add, you know, maybe countries who are economically smaller than us, but they would compete in certain fields. You know. So okay. I mean, say, for example, you have a Vietnam. Now, Vietnam is a much smaller economy. But the fact is Vietnam competes when it comes to certain kinds of investment. Okay. So the bottom line, I think what the young people need to know is that today, it is all about building strengths. That when you say make in India, when you say start up India, when you say Gati Shakti, you know, you need, nobody's going to manufacture in India. What is Gati Shakti? Let me know, please, please, please. Interesting. I really like where he's going with this. If your infrastructure is lousy. Okay. So they need to see the, you know, the smart ports, the good roads, the rapid movement of goods. Now, if you have to do all this, if you really need to create jobs. To me, at the end of the day, it's all about creating jobs and opportunities. There are many roads to it. Even foreign policy. I would say, especially foreign policy, is one route, which is our job is also to market India, to brand India, to, to make India a magnet so that the rest of the world says, okay, these are responsible guys, these are safe guys, let's go and do business. Out. I love him. Honestly, he is, he's bang on the money. I, there's nothing I do not agree with him on. You know, they're not going to steal your stuff. <clears throat> okay. Basically, chase excellence, create employment. Uh, and as we move forward in this chase of individual excellence, you will achieve national excellence. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, love that. Of I love that. I absolutely love that. It's so right. So bang on the money, as I just said. Global. I mean, in the global sport of geopolitics. Absolutely. All right. Well, well said. Uh, when you meet one of our rival nations, foreign ministers, uh -huh. like we saw you doing the Namaste to Bilawal Bhutto, uh, what is your interaction with him, which the news doesn't capture, which only podcasts can potentially capture? Mm -hmm. And what's your interaction like with, say, the Chinese foreign minister, if you meet him? Diplomacy is a is an art of detail in a way. Okay, there's a lot of nuance, you know, body language, how you dress, what you say, how you look, how you hold your hands or don't hold your hands. So 
they all of all of this uh, comes you're saying uh, you it depends on the person it depends on the situation it depends you know the the context of relationship. relationship yes yes that also so you try to use uh, you try to use it's like a choreography so you you use that occasion to do the signaling i i could modulate it uh, depending on that so it would it would depend on on the situation so there are times and occasions uh, so i i wouldn't say there's a single formula okay a uh, very raw question for you so please. pardon me from crossing the no, line no, no. uh what's the most pissed off you've gotten at one of these meetings i'm sure something <laughs> would have been said that just irritated you as a human i'm actually really curious what uh, mr jishankar is going to say uh, the, as as the moderator has been very out there for a diplomat i guess and what was your response and you don't need to name or you can name if you want <laughs> you know rarely by personal things because mostly i've learned to absorb it uh, it it uh, sort of uh, uh, i take it's part of the course for me that's right sure. what happens is things do get under my skin and i i give you a recent example i've spoken about it. you know i was getting i was actually landed i forget from bangalore or something on a plane and i saw this picture of this guy climbing up the indian high commission in london and trying to pull down a flag so absolutely it got under my skin so uh, or if people you know they try interesting it's it's you know i i like the fact that he's basically saying like over my entire career i learn how to bounce these things off uh, but there i actually quite like that he <clears throat> had a point of view on taking the the flag down or having something to do because it i i quite like that it it just makes him i guess a person that is proud of his country and you know like clearly the country has achieved so much over the last decade and and why is such a i don't want to say injustice but you you call it whatever uh should be happening to my country i'm i'm proud i'm from india and wh- how dare you and i like that i like that about him i am score points you know i i personal points i just shrug it okay but, but if if i feel in some way the collective i in some way is demeaned or attacked or something yes uh, you know that's when when i said when i get pushed okay i mean that that i as you rightly said is not me the i but i the india but and i love that when he says like i the india because he's um well actually from if we're talking spirituality like he was trying to push him uh, earlier i think perhaps he's understanding the collective importance of the country and that we're all one and we're all like indians and i represent them and i guess in the indian people would really disagree with that act and i you know and i'm appalled by it and i'm i'm angered by it and you know as as perhaps many of my fellow uh people would and i like that that sense that some if you're not given the respect or you're not uh, you if your people are condescending Oh, mm-hmm. sometimes people ambush you. Yeah. Well, okay. And professionally, when do you feel the most alive? Like when do you feel that you were born to do exactly this? Uh, that's a feeling which kind of grew on me over a period of time. Uh, mm-hmm. Part of it was, you know, I actually studied international relations, which is not that usual for people in diplomats. Now I'm uh, I'm only the second foreign minister who's actually been a diplomat. Not Wersing was the only other guy uh, who'd been in that. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, uh, you know, my studies, my my past long profession. my current uh, my current uh, responsibility and even i had a brief break in business even that was international i was with the tata group and they, they gave me a kind of ah tata group i know that uh, my brother is going to work for them role in international business so i've been do in that sense that feeling that you're bound to do this frankly has grown a lot and uh, in a way you know i also came from a household which was very international i live international i mean uh, you know my family relationships are international i spend most of my time international so interesting uh, i guess it's sort of in you okay uh, but at this stage of your life is there any moment occasionally you know i do give lifestyle advice to younger people rarely <laughs> rarely mostly when they ask okay, okay. I, i don't dispense advice <laughs> i tell people look if you like if you really like doing i i like when he says like when they ask because sometimes i guess not all of us really like unsolicited advice and that's just the wisdom of his age i would uh, and in in his uh, you know experience chatting through i love that think something you'll be very good at hmm? the problem with most of us is we end up doing things which are not necessarily what we want to do it's what we told to do is what we told to do or we you know circumstances make it shock okay so yeah. for me look i always like reading about the world i like listening to music of the world i like eating global food something consuming youtube bought us uh, so <laughs> so so you know it, it's been a, a mix of all of that so that what you say if you're bound to do it yeah sure i mean all of this gets into that yeah you you it's, okay. it's a natural okay you know, all right yeah. uh this is a question honestly i love the guy he is the energy he gives in he's just so humble so considerate so nice so kind it's it's just so rare to see this in politicians let me know what you think and that comes from the engineer inside me 
are you following the AI revolution based on whatever is happening in the world? I'm sure you are. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was just an intro to the question. Okay, that's podcasting techniques. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of AI. I would love for you to also give an input on the role of quantum computing because it's come up in geopolitical conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you look at it from your perspective? The future of technology, I don't know if you should watch this uh, show called Black Mirror. No, I haven't. Okay, it's about the technologies that are upcoming. Uh -huh. And you all know Harari says that the stuff they've shown in Black Mirror is so realistic. It's either already happening or it's going to happen in five to 10 years. Or it'll happen once you watch the show. <laughs> wow. I mean, Black Mirror, have you any of you watched that? I think I'll need to jot it down and watch it for myself. It's interesting. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> science fiction determines where science goes. <laughs> but uh, do you follow uh, whatever's happening in the world of engineering technology? And how do you look at it affecting our country, our foreign policy, et cetera, et cetera? You know, I'm not an engineer. And I'll give you what I hope is like a common sense answer from my perspective. And I'll take you back actually to your first question. Sure. You asked me, do I watch patterns? Okay. Sure, I watch patterns. That's how I do my business. That's why I think I can be good at my business. Yeah. Now, just imagine, I am humanly, because I have limited capabilities as a human being, I'm watching the patterns of 200 people who I deal with every day. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I could process the patterns of 200 million people. So that's the world which you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But with each one of us, we are like a walking emitter of electronic patterns. Okay, you know, what you download, what you say, what you listen to, what you buy, what you eat. You're creating, I mean, earlier on, there would have been a pattern, but you couldn't see it. Okay, today that pattern is organized. So it's, it's interesting because what he's saying, he is really spotting trends in, and yeah, and then AI is spotting trends on like a global level. It has actually become a business. It has become politics. It has become strategy. It is actually at the end of the day, this, this, uh, how do you, um, sort of mega process patterns and that then gives you a fantastic edge. So, I mean, imagine, imagine a Virat Kohli who has at his fingertips, everything about everybody is ever going to be batting against. Man, that's a dream world. Isn't it? We will predict each delivery, each strategy. So maybe the way we should build out artificial intelligence as humans is we should develop an AI based assistant for you, <laughs> for you to be able to, you know, that's Somebody, it'll happen. <laughs> or is it already happening? You never know. Okay. Um, <laughs> How often do quantum computing conversations come up? Because it's come up on the show from the geopolitical perspective. The first country that cracks it will... Right now, actually, if you ask me what's right on our plate, it's much more semiconductors. You know, there's this whole chip war, uh, which is going on. And you can say a tech war, which is going on. Uh, so a lot of what we are doing today is about that. Uh, and uh, okay. uh, it's about uh, how do you actually prepare uh, for an era where, you know, uh, sort of chips, you can say, is the new oil. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, in fact, I, you know, I, I was uh, a week ago in Europe uh, and... Uh, uh, thereafter with the PM in uh, the, at the Quad in uh, in uh, Japan. And uh, a big part of those conversations were really about how, you know, countries cooperate to ensure uh, what we call trusted collaboration, which is uh, countries who have that uh, faith in each other, uh, who have similar systems. We use the word like-minded. You know, these are normally market economies, democracies, uh, sort of, uh, how, you know, people with companies who follow like, company ethics and rules like we know. How do these countries really come together and create a, a kind of a supply chain? Now, here's the bit which I think particularly uh, your younger listeners should look at. Uh, there was a time 10 years ago, maybe more, seven, eight years ago even, I used to go around telling people, saying, you know, look, uh, you need to open up your economy more, you know, mobility, there's Indians who would be looking for uh, opportunities to work because we really start, especially under Prime Minister Modi, he, one thing keeps dinning into us, you know, think of the world as a global workplace. Okay, this is one like, interesting. regular message we get from him in every possible way. As a global workplace? Global, global workplace. It's very interesting what he's saying. That don't think, you know, your work opportunities could be anywhere. Now, it's your job in foreign policy to open up those doors. Okay, you know, why should a talented Indian be restricted? Okay, now if you are going to work everywhere, then this does not be... Very fair, why should a talented anybody be restricted anywhere in the world, right? Okay, science, okay. I mean, you have people working in merchant shipping, in air crews, uh, in blue collar jobs, in professional jobs, a chartered account, any profession you take. How do you actually give a full kind of uh, space for Indian talent to do its best? Now, coming back to this, I find because today we are moving into that tech competition or tech wars era, there's a huge demand today for trusted talent, for people who play by the rules, who understand how the international uh, you know, business systems work, skilled people, talented people. And these are, you know, these are the age group you know, we are looking at kind of below 35. They are massively in demand uh, in the world. And we just came out of Australia. We did a mobility agreement. It's very interesting what he's saying. I think he's actually quite right there because with the whole technology, you have to be able to trust because there's just so much, you know, maybe um, not well-intentioned people in there too. Uh, the week before I signed one with Austria, Austria, you know, is not a country which you immediately think of in terms of uh, migration. 
Uh, By the way, just so you know, uh, Austria is bordering with Slovakia and actually takes an hour on train to get from Bratislava, capital, to uh, Vienna, capital. We've done it with Germany, uh, with a number of European countries, and even with the US. Uh, you know, Prime Minister is going to be going there next month. Uh, a lot of it is, look, uh, how do we create the flows? Now, these kind of flows are going to be very different. It's, you know, it's like, well, you are very familiar, perhaps more than me. Your habits change. People don't have to leave India anymore to work somewhere. The global workplace doesn't mean you shift your place. It just means your employer doesn't have to be in the same town or the same country. You know, or the service you render doesn't have to be there. So that's the kind of world, you know, we are getting prepared for. So for me, if you look at the, at the tech space, uh, it's actually interesting what he's talking about global workspace because I've just been recently researching the future of work and how things are going to happen and there's already a lot of conversations about the policies uh, to do with the future of work and how to enhance that mobility but there is interesting things that are happening because um, in order to create a global workforce companies have to be flexible right and what we've just seen and i think that it's just so heavily right now in the news is google who is like forcing people now going back to the office in fact they will be tracking them and it was an interesting point of view from someone that i read on linkedin when they were saying that google has done their analysis and perhaps it's more profitable for them which would be in contradiction contradiction to you know building the global workforce so um and obviously apparently there are other studies i haven't read them but there, apparently there's been lots of other studies where it shows that working from home is actually uh beneficial for people but i'm very curious how this is going to actually play out because i think that the workforce since covid has been uh, very much into you know working from home being flexible some people prefer to go to the office some people work uh, prefer to work on their own but i think there still will perhaps be a push for way more open global economy and very curious how what what, what will be the place that india will take in all of that the global workplace, the mobility the semiconductor the what called critical emerging technologies this is really what is sucking up the oxygen when I was growing up in the 2000s and early 2010s, you'd often go for family functions where the families would encourage the kids to leave India. And that used to piss me off when I was a kid. Why do you want to leave really? your family? Let's do something for the family. Maybe that's just a cricket fan in me talking. Okay. So, I mean, I'm so curious to hear. So, do, do, did you live in a household where people were encouraging you to leave, leave India? And it's interesting to say that he was not excited about that. I think it's it's personally, I think that you should go out and explore and, and find your place in the world, wherever that may be. But it led me in the right direction. More than half of all the engineering students with me in college left the country. Uh, a lot of them wish to come back. I want you to directly address those people who are on the fence about coming back. How do we reverse this brain drain problem? That's one part of the question. Two, please address the parents who still want their kids to leave the country. And please address the kids who want to leave the country for whatever reason. Look, uh, you know, I, I, I would put it, I would define the issue differently from you. Sure. If you define it as, you know, brain drain, here's our country, there is abroad, why are you leaving? Uh, you're give, making it a kind of choice which you may not necessarily get the outcomes you want. Okay, I put it to you very differently. It's, you know, the world's like a kind of a membrane. Huh? You can go in and out. And actually, that's what's going to happen. You know, I see, uh, you know, I actually encounter a lot of people who do a job, go abroad, do a job, come back, go again abroad. The days when you said, oh, if I leave a foreign country and come back to India, my, you know, oh my God, maybe I'll never go back again. Now that's no longer the case. So what you say, yeah, sure, maybe 10, 15 years ago, that's the way the world was. I think we need to today recognize that, uh, you know, there was a time when you said, a short-term job is what is the employer's preference. For a lot of people today uh, would actually say, okay, let me take this, but I'm not sure I'm going to commit my entire life to this. That's also happening. So the job is changing, the people are changing, mobility is changing, global economy is changing. I think you're going to see a lot of this up and down, uh, uh, you know, movement. And people will also realize in many industries that actually you may get an opportunity in India, which may be better than an opportunity abroad. Yeah, yeah. Sure. We have too many Indian Steve Wozniak sitting in America right now who studied, gained experiences of working in tech there. We have a lot of Steve Jobs in India who are looking for Wozniaks to come back here and build the kind of companies that we're seeing built out in Silicon Valley. So do you have anything to say about that? Is that correct thinking? Look, uh, I, I... It's very interesting uh, because obviously, like I come from a small country and um, it's just 5 million people. And I would make that assumption and after talking to people in here that um, most people that kind of were... I'm not saying all, but a lot of people that were very driven, that left the country and they're contributing to different economies. Um, and then you would experience that brain drain or fluctuation. But obviously there is also a percentage of very smart people that retain and they're running the country. Um, 
but um but i think that sometimes it has to do and i would imagine and correct me if i'm wrong that um india is a very perhaps by my perception a uh, very like family focus and the, the the ties are very strong and so it's actually slovakia uh but obviously some of us are naturally more um family oriented than, than the others and i feel that people that tend to come back or stay in the first place is because they they enjoy and like the culture and and for them perhaps the family is the number one value and they and then the the personal development and the career comes second i would love to hear your thoughts on this one actually i uh, i've been to silicon valley a few times i see changes even in silicon valley you know, uh, silicon valley today is much more interested in the values of india you know, that's also happening so it's not like it's not like escape to silicon valley and guys now i found nirvana anymore anymore <laughs> i i think you're seeing a, a lot of people okay. you know out there coming back you, you know also look even oh people out there when they now see uh, i mean you take the example of apple okay I, you know you know why it's been an important event is it's had a very strong resonance at different level it's had a resonance in manufacturing it's it's a it's a kind of validation of an improved business atmosphere it's also by the way a testament to the quality of people they find no this frankly this wouldn't have happened 10 years ago mm. so it's, it's a very good example look i can always tell anybody you know everything is much better 10 years now you say okay show me the proof you mean that's a proof you know when you actually have a uh, good global companies and the other uh, interesting thing is when you have indian companies the big ones who are actually now saying you know maybe maybe i'm going to invest a bit more in india uh, i don't need to necessarily hedge by going out uh, so that too is a factor so things are happening okay why are you doing this podcast you know i'm doing this podcast one because i like you huh? uh, I- oh that's okay to him to say a hey, because i like you uh, but it feels like he had to say it to to actually give him a real answer a good diplomat i but to uh, i'm also doing it because i feel today you need to to get people to understand what what we are about what the government's about what the world is about and different people uh, different people absorb differently okay you know there's still people i mean the beauty with india is you have uh, 20 different mediums spread over 200 years all of them are still working huh? you know it's like having an old model that's also working and the latest gizmo is also working so today man ki baat also works okay newspapers also work but it's it's who you're talking to okay so uh, you know, this is a different set of people i'm talking to fair i but i feel like he's a bit slightly uncomfortable with that question i don't think that he was prepared to to go into this podcast to answer a question like that let me know what you think the different generation of people i'm talking about. i would love to believe that my podcast audience is the one that wants aggressive growth it's the virat kohli's of uh, the future of the country i hope so uh, so considering that these are all extremely aggressive leaders one last question for you in this chat and i hope it's the first chat of many many more chats mm-hmm. we have eventually what's your message to all the young virat kohli's watching this and young jamima rodrix is watching this cool i love this guy i mean the moderator i i presume he's quite famous but he's just I, you can clearly see how he, excited he is about talking with him and talking about his topics it's very endearing take the country further <laughs> you know i'm so glad you used the second name because Uh, I mean, I I actually this year got really I mean it's something which I followed for some time, but I I think when I watch the women's uh, league uh, and I, and I find that that's something uh, which is also really uh, you know when you it's like watching a new emerging uh, kind of activity. Uh, but uh, you, you know Vikings would always invade with the women as well. Okay, all right. We need to be Vikings now. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, you notice I'm not disputing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the uh, the no look my message would be different era have self belief. I mean this the the kind of opportunities. the 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 uh, the possibilities of this era are very different uh, i think today is very important at one level you know i spoke about- i think he is very right like opportunities that were like even 10 years ago are, are vastly different from the opportunities of today and i i feel like if if the guys have talking about a you know the future of work and global workforce i think like we're going to see such a significant shift in the next couple of years that uh one year maybe will feel like 10 as in like in previous about thinking big uh, and thinking kind of practical deep detail similarly i would say we need to look at the big choices we make the national choices we make we need to look at the personal choices we make they are not diverse from each other a good sound national choice actually widens your personal choices uh, and i you know love that so true he he totally has his head screwed well on his shoulders 
It's amazing, this guy. Hey, look, anybody with age wants to be younger. Okay, it's a, it's a natural feeling. But truly, for someone who's today, say 20, there's a world waiting on them for to happen. I agree. Uh, and and I completely agree with him. I I, uh, I think it's the obligation of people like us uh, to, to to sort of open that up as much to prepare it as much to create that kind of table. This man is just so smart. I can't. I can't. <laughs> and when I, uh, you know, maybe the next chat we should do this. Actually, you look at Indian cricket and Indian diplomacy. I, I think there's a lot that they could learn. Of. Cricket and diplomacy, very interesting. I've never watched a game of cricket, or maybe I have, but maybe for a second, and I found it very, let's put it politely, long. From each other. That could be a subject in itself. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> so many more tangential questions just related to that thought. Um, one last question. There's also a lot of YouTubers, and I would like to say extremely early thought leaders. Maybe we are, because we do influence a large mass of people. What's your message for them? Do, what role do we have uh, for our country? Look, I I think the uh, today you honestly don't have to be experienced, which is another nice way of saying a little older, <laughs> to 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 lead. You know, leadership can come from a young person. Conversely, you know there are there are people uh, who who uh, may be older who would relate to a young person precisely because they have that kind of confidence. You know, I I was I, uh, I was very struck. I was reading some. It's interesting what he's saying. Um, I think with TV um, because, yes, literature can come from young people. I, I still do feel, and it was so funny yesterday, I just had a conversation with someone and that I know, and they are very young, incredibly smart. They're going to do so great in their life. But I can tell that they are obviously frustrated where, that they are not where they ought for them to be. And I feel it's because of the lack of experience. Like they, there is this, the zeal and eagerness is being young and inspirational. And sometimes it, it works well for other people because they they see themselves and they see themselves in, in younger people. They see the courage that they haven't had because they, they had to lead different lives. But now things are just so much more democratized and, and then you're able to actually live a decent life without needing to maybe so much worry about where your pay paycheck is coming from, although it's it's a big consideration. Um, but I do, I would add that young people do need to have experience uh, because the experience then, and, and, and I, I, don't, I don't particularly agree with that experience is about older people. Like, look, like some, you know, 13 year olds are smashing it out on their TikTok and it's because they've gained the experience. So you can be young and you can be experienced. It doesn't have to exclude one another. It's just sometimes what I see is that young may not be as experienced, which is nothing wrong with that. It's just about like, you know, realizing that, realizing that, you know, I only have this much of life knowledge and experience and, and I'm keen on building that. I'm not getting this courage along the way. And one of the points you made was, how is it that Narendra Modi is today a youth icon? You know, why is he a youth icon? It's a very interesting question. It's worth thinking about. What's a youth tight? Well, I'm not too sure if I'm understanding what he's saying, actually. So I think that's a good note uh, to end this session. So I, I too look forward to another one. Uh, at some stage, I've given you an idea today, but always open to your thoughts. Dr. Jay Shankar, owner of my life. That's Thank all you. I will say. Thank you. Everything you're doing, the whole I is India conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that secretly. Uh, the youth is obsessed with geopolitics nowadays. Thank you, sir. Means a lot. Looking forward to talking to you sure. again. If I may uh, be able to do some luck to fist bump sure. you. Oh. And say thanks. Thank you. Learning to you every day. Well, that's so cute. I mean, I absolutely very much enjoyed um doing this podcast um a review with you guys i i think that um i i'm a big fan of jay shankar i think that he was just trying to you know show his personality and i think he still does come across as a this very lo lovely i would even say loving person and uh um, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please do um, give it thumbs up, subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Up until then, take care. Bye.